Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Welcome to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University, where the rats run free while the humans are under mask mandate, but where we have free flowing access to all the finest broadband internet you can drink. Before I pass to the host, I will quickly explain the plan. First, everyone in the Zoom session should take note that your image and or voice may be recorded and broadcast live via YouTube. If you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This evening, we will have a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions. We'll be taking questions both from within the Zoom session and from the YouTube chat. To ask a question from within Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. I will then call on you one by one to unmute yourselves, turn on your video and ask your questions. During the talk, participants in the Zoom session will remain muted and will not be allowed to unmute. To ask a question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors will be asked to log out of the Zoom session and undergrads, grads, and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Paul Wiseman to introduce the speaker. Paul. Thanks, Masked Man Bill. Uh, and I just want, it's my pleasure to introduce our physics colloquium speaker uh, today. I uh, was really hoping we could host uh, Malike Lakadem Yemi uh, in person, but of course this is the new normal, but it's, uh, we're certainly pleased that she could join us to give a virtual colloquium. So Malike is an associate professor in the department of physiology and is uh, also uh, associate, uh, associate Professor in Cell and Development, Developmental Biology at University of Pennsylvania. But as we'll see, Maliki's training was as a physicist. So uh, she started in terms of a Bachelor of Science in, in Physics at the University of Texas at Austin before continuing on to Harvard University where she completed her PhD in physics with uh, Professor Zhao Wei Zhang as her uh, supervisor very famous uh, researcher in terms of super resolution. And we're certainly going to hear about super resolution imaging today. Meleke uh, went on to uh, for a postdoctoral fellowship in the Center for Brain Science at Harvard University with Professor Jeff Lichtman, and then started her independent research career um, at the ICFO uh, Center for Bio Institute for Photonic Sciences in Barcelona, Spain, where she was a junior and senior group leader. Uh, in 2017, she came back across the Atlantic and started at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has continued since then doing some amazing work in terms of uh, revealing the uh, inside and workings of cells using exquisite super resolution microscopy techniques. I just want to mention she has many uh, honors and awards. I just want to highlight a, a couple of them. Uh, for those of you who have neuroscience background, uh, Maleke uh, won the Ramon Cajal Fellowship from the Spanish Ministry of Education. Uh, she was profiled in the Journal of Cell Science as cell scientists to watch. And I think that's impressive in terms of having somebody as a physicist who's really uh, uh, a cell scientist to watch just to show you the uh, breadth that one can accomplish in terms of this field. Uh, in 2019, she was awarded the Linda uh, Pechnik Montague Investigator Award and the list goes on. However, I'd like to turn it over to Maleke uh, for her talk where she will describe visualizing the inner life of cells with super resolution microscopy. Maliki, thank you for joining us virtually for the McGill Physics Colloquium. Thank you, Paul, very much uh, for the introduction and also uh, Paul and Bill for the kind invitation. Um, I wish I could have visited Montreal in person. Um, it's one of my favorite cities and I always love an excuse to, to come there. Um, but I'm still very grateful for this opportunity to tell you about my work. Um, so I'm going to start with a broad overview. Um, in my lab, we're interested in this um, general question of how the cell is organized in space and in time. Um, so as you know, cells are not just bags of nucleic acids and proteins, but in fact, they're highly compartmentalized. And this compartmentalization is very important for ensuring that biochemical reactions happen at the right place and at the right time. Um, 
So we are interested in understanding this compartmentalization both uh, within the cytoplasm. Um, in particular, we are interested in understanding how organelles um, transport within the cytoplasm of the cell and spatially position at specific places. And the role of the microtubule cytoskeleton and motor proteins in mediating that spatial organization and how those processes may break down in diseases. We are also interested in uh, nuclear organization, in particular, the organization of chromatin and how that regulates gene activity. And as we work on these topics, we often realize that existing methods have limitations. So we also try to develop new methods to help us um, overcome those limitations and study the biology that we are interested in. And today I uh, decided that I am going to focus on our work on uh, nuclear organization and chromatin organization. Uh, but while talking about chromatin, I also hope to highlight some of the methods that we develop in order to study this problem at high resolution and in a highly quantitative manner. So I want to start with a, a brief introduction uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, chromatin. Um, if you search for um, you know, chromatin and chromosome uh, structure organization um, in uh, Google, um, you'll find a lot of videos. And I'm going to show you one of those videos that was made by HHMI um, that will walk us through um, the textbook model of how um, we think um, uh, chromosomes are organized inside the nucleus. Um, so what you're looking at here is uh, naked DNA. Um, and as you know, DNA is a very large biomolecule. Um, so human DNA, when stretched end to end, measures two meters in length. And that two meter long DNA has to fit inside the space of a nucleus, which is only about 20 microns in size. And so as you can imagine, this requires an enormous amount of compaction. And this compaction happens in the form of chromatin. So chromatin is a complex between DNA and proteins, in particular histone proteins. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, this movie now. I'm going to turn off the speakers on my uh, computer because I don't want to hear the sound. Um, so you see here um, DNA just uh, jiggling around, presumably inside the nucleus. And you'll see uh, proteins, histone proteins coming in. In this particular movie, they will fly from the top of the movie magically land on DNA. And then you'll uh, see more histone proteins come in. Uh, you need a co uh, eight copies of these histone proteins. And the DNA then wraps around in uh, two turns around this octamer of histone proteins forming the nucleosome. And this is the basic packaging unit of chromatin. And then multiple nucleosomes, again, somewhat magically self-assemble by uh, coming into close proximity and compacting into what is known as the 30 nanometer fiber. And that 30 nanometer fiber then uh, falls into um, larger structures inside the nucleus. Um, so this uh, uh, movie is very impressive. Um, it uh, uh, gives the impression that we really understand everything that needs to be known about how DNA is compacted um, uh, and how chromatin is organized inside the nucleus. Uh, but of course, um, again, uh, as you know, uh, this is not a real movie. It's just an animation. And in fact, uh, we don't really have a microscope that can generate um, this type of a molecular scale movie. Um, and during my talk, I will go over the reasons uh, why that is the case. Um, but um, our textbook understanding of how uh, DNA is compacted and chromatin is organized comes from mostly electron micrograph uh, images of in vitro reconstituted chromatin fibers. Um, so here are some examples of uh, such electron micrographs. On the top, you can see this beautiful beads on a string-like organization. Um, and um, um, this was done by mixing, again, DNA with uh, histones in vitro. Um, and then on the bottom, uh, you can see the larger structure, the 30 nanometer fiber, uh, which forms under specific ionic strength uh, conditions and also with the addition of um, additional histone proteins like 
linker histones, you can further compact this um, uh, 10 nanometer fiber into a 30 nanometer fiber. Um, so this type of uh, in vitro reconstitution assays uh, led to this uh, textbook model, um, which I'm showing you here again, uh, of this very ordered and hierarchical organization of chromatin going from a bits on a string 10 nanometer fiber to a 30 nanometer fiber to larger structures up to the mitotic chromosome. And as you can imagine, um, these uh, small length scales in the order of 10 to 100 nanometers are very important for regulating gene activity. Um, so if, um, sorry, if um, DNA is within these very compact structures like the um, 30 nanometer fiber, uh, the genetic code is not accessible to regulatory proteins and polymerases. So to be transcribed, uh, the chromatin has to unfold making the DNA more easily accessible. And these um, larger structures um, are important for bringing distant genomic regions in close proximity in the 3D space of the nucleus. For example, an enhancer and a promoter, further regulating gene activity. So in my lab, we are very interested in visualizing chromatin at these length scales inside intact cells. And we want to understand how the chromatin fiber is remodeled at these length scales in order to activate and repress genes. Um, and just to give this a little bit more uh, motivation, we are interested in this in the context of cell fate transitions. Um, so as you know, all cells in our body come from stem cells and stem cells can differentiate to generate any cell type in the body. And these uh, differentiated specialized cells can also be reprogrammed into a more pluripotent stem cell-like state. Um, and all these cells um, at the end have the exact same genetic code. Um, so the sequence of the DNA does not change during these transitions. But um, the cells look very different from one another. Um, they uh, certainly express different genes um, and morphologically and functionally, they're very different. Um, and we think that chromatin structure, especially at these small length scales, is very important for regulating um, these processes and ensuring um, transition into the correct cell phase. And so we would like to be able to visualize um, how chromatin structure is remodeled during these cell phase transitions. Um, but doing this is not straightforward inside the context of an intact cell, intact nucleus. Um, and um, again, here's an example. This is again an electron micrograph of the nucleus of a cell. Uh, in this case, um, the cell is intact. Um, so this is not in vitro reconstituted chromatin. And you can see here um, um, within the nucleus regions that are rather dark and regions that are uh, much lighter. And the dark regions tend to be at the edge of the nucleus, at the nuclear periphery and around nucleoli. Um, and so um, these type of images again led to the conclusion that chromatin is not just randomly distributed inside the nucleus, in fact, it's compartmentalized. Um, and these uh, dark compartments uh, is known as heterochromatin that contains silenced uh, genes. Um, and the lighter compartment is known as the euchromatin that contains the more active uh, extra expressed genes. Um, and the heterochromatin, again, tends to be at the nuclear periphery around the nucleoli, whereas the euchromatin tends to be um, inside the nuclear interior. But um, zooming into this image and looking at chromatin structure at the length scales that I was talking about at this 10 to 100 nanometer length scale, is really not possible. And this is because electron microscopy in its most common form lacks uh, molecular specificity. Um, so what we're looking at here is everything inside the nucleus that is electron dense. Um, and so we don't really have a way um, in most common forms of electron microscopy to specifically label um, nucleosomes, histones, and um, visualize how they look like under the electron microscope. And so um, in my lab, we mostly use fluorescence microscopy, light microscopy, uh, which has complementary advantages to electron microscopy. And one of the main advantages is that it has molecular specificity. 
So we can actually attach um, labels, tags, um, to whatever protein we want. And we can visualize our protein of interest under a light microscope. So for example, we can put fluorescent labels um, on histone proteins that form the nucleosome so that we can visualize nucleosomes um, about a dark background. So we gain contrast. Now, if we do that, and again, we uh, take a normal light microscope image, um, this is what we see. Um, so again, um, you get this impression from this image that nucleosomes are perhaps not uniformly distributed inside the nucleus. So this is the nucleus of a fibroblast cell. Um, there are some regions of this image that are darker, again, other regions that are brighter. Um, but beyond that, it's very difficult, again, to make any conclusions about nucleosome organization at the small length scales that we are interested in, simply because um, light microscopy lacks the spatial resolution uh, that is necessary to do that. Um, so what do I mean by that? Now, the labels that we use to tag our proteins are very small. They're at molecular level. So um, here I'm showing you a fluorescent protein. And the size of that fluorescent protein is only a few nanometers. But uh, when we use light and lenses to make an image of that uh, fluorescent protein, the image itself is much larger. Um, um, in fact, it's two orders of magnitude larger um, than the actual size of the fluorescent molecule. And this is because of diffraction, because of the wavelength of light. Um, the um, image becomes uh, broadened um, to a size of about two to 300 nanometers. Um, and so when we have two of these fluorescent molecules, when they're very far apart from one another, we will see two blobs under our microscope and we can discriminate them and we can say there are two molecules there. But when they get very close to each other, um, their images will merge and overlap and we will no longer be able to discriminate one molecule from another molecule. And this is what we uh, mean when we speak about spatial resolution in light microscopy. It's your ability to discriminate two fluorescent molecules that are in very close proximity. And that's limited by diffraction, uh, by the wavelength of uh, light to about uh, two to 300 nanometers. Uh, but I'm sure you know that this limitation, um, the diffraction limit was broken. Um, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2014, the Breakthrough Prize in 2019 um, to uh, the developers of super resolution microscopy. Um, now, typically I split these methods into two main categories, uh, those like STED or structured illumination that work by shaping the illumination light. And those methods down here, um, like storm, palm, that work uh, by um, single molecule detection and localization. And in my lab, we mostly use um, these methods. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time giving you a bit of introduction and background on how uh, this works. Um, so as I mentioned, the image of an individual molecule is not a point, um, it's much broader. But even though the image is very broad, we can still, um, we have a lot of information actually. We know exactly where the molecule is. Um, so we can uh, localize the position of the molecule very precisely if we find the center position of the image. And the precision by which we can do that depends on mainly the brightness of the molecule, how many photons we collect from it. And um, you know, we can have uh, nanometer precision in being able to localize the position of the molecule. Um, this of course works if we only have one fluorescent molecule. Um, but if we are in a crowded situation, which is always the case when we are looking at things inside the cell, where we have these fluorescent molecules attached to proteins that are very close to each other, then we no longer have this ability because the images of multiple uh, fluorophores will merge and overlap and we will no longer be able to discriminate one molecule from another. And so uh, to really break the diffraction limit, uh, methods like Storm and Palm uh, take advantage of uh, another concept, which is photo switching. Um, so in fact, what we do is we label um, our structure of interest with photo switchable fluorophores um, that can be uh, switched on and off between bright and dark states. 
Um, and I'm going to show you again a quick example of how it works using microtubules as an example. This is another structure that I'm very interested in in my lab. Um, so in this case, these microtubules were labeled uh, with photoswitchable fluorophores. And again, under normal light illumination conditions, um, they appear like this, um, a diffraction limited image. In fact, microtubules are uh, linear polymers that are only 30 nanometer in uh, diameter, but that's certainly not what we see under a normal light microscope image. Now in super resolution microscopy, what we do is we use um, light illumination conditions in which we actually switch off the fluorescence of most of these molecules into a dark state. So they are no longer visible. And then uh, we activate the fluorescence of just a few molecules at a time, such that they're spatially isolated from one another. So now we can discriminate individual molecules. Each one of these bluish reddish blobs is an individual fluorescent molecule. And we can find their center position and we can put a dot um, to uh, represent the center position of each individual molecule. And over time, by activating new fluorophores and collecting more dots, we can reconstruct a high resolution image of the underlying structure, which is no longer limited by diffraction. And so if we apply this method um, to visualizing chromatin, um, then we get a very different picture. Um, we, um, not surprisingly, improve the spatial resolution dramatically. Now it becomes very clear that nucleosomes are not uniformly and distributed everywhere inside the nucleus. In fact, there are regions uh, that completely seem to lack nucleosomes. And nucleosomes seem to be enriched in these bright spots, uh, which I'm going to call nucleosome nanodomains for now. And these nucleosome nanodomains seem to further come in close proximity, forming these uh, larger structures or domains. And so uh, we spend quite a lot of our time thinking about what these images are telling us about um, nucleosome organization. So here again, another example of a super resolution image of nucleosomes. And what we would like to do is be able to extract patterns from these images at multiple length scales. Um, and so we apply um, certain segmentation methods in order to be able to do that. And um, what I'm showing you here again is an intensity based representation of the super resolution image but our underlying raw data is not intensity based. So what we have is in fact points in space uh, that correspond to positions of fluorophores. And so what we do um, in this case um, is we use an approach known as Voronoi tessellation. This is an approach that has been around for a very long time and it was uh, adapted for super resolution by microscopy uh, by Jean-Baptiste Sibarita's lab in Bordeaux. And so um, again, uh, we have point data. Uh, each point represents the position of a fluorophore. Um, and we divide the points uh, with these uh, lines into equal space. And uh, we end up drawing uh, what is called these Voronoi polygons around each point in space. And the size of those Voronoi polygons is going to depend on um, the proximity of the points to each other. Um, so how close they are and how dense they are. Um, so in particular regions that are dense that contain a lot of points are going to have small polygons and regions that are sparse that contain only a few points are going to have large polygons. And so now what we can do is we can put a threshold on polygon size. Uh, we can say we will remove very large polygons that likely correspond to background and noise we're going to um, then uh, um, um, connect the remaining polygons and color code them if they share an edge with one another. And what this allows us to do is to segment these images. And here's uh, an example of that. So now I'm showing you the same image, pseudo color coded according to this segmentation. Um, so again, the colors correspond to the connectivity of points by these Voronoi polygons in space. And what you can notice here is, uh, first of all, this green domain that surrounds um, the periphery of the nucleus. Um, now, this is 
constitutive heterochromatin. This is the condensed uh, chromatin that you can also see in electron microscopy that mainly is localized at the nuclear periphery. And because it's so condensed and there are so many nucleosomes there, uh, we can segment it as one contiguous domain. But if we go inside the interior of the nucleus, um, we can also find domains that are smaller in size, um, corresponding to uh, from a few hundred nanometers to few microns in size. Um, in terms of genomic length scales, that's hundreds of kilobases to several megabases in size. Um, and um, people who are familiar with the field of uh, genome organization might have heard of topologically associating domains. So these are domains that were revealed by uh, genomic methods. Um, and the DNA within these topologically associating domains tend to self-interact uh, with itself as opposed to the DNA sequences outside of the domain. And these topologically associating domains are exactly at the size range of um, uh, these domains here. And so we are wondering if these could be uh, TADs. Um, of course, here we don't have sequence specificity. So we are labeling uh, chromatin globally in a sequence non-specific way. And so currently we are working on also adding sequence information on top of these images in order to dissect uh, what the nucleosome level organization looks like within these different types of uh, domains inside the nucleus. Now, if I zoom up to one of these domains, it seems to be made up of subdomains. These are the nucleosome nanodomains that I mentioned to you earlier. Again, in terms of uh, length scale, they're um, uh, 20, 30 nanometers in size. Um, and this is at the level of our spatial resolution. And so we can't really see what's within these domains. We don't have enough spatial resolution. So again, we scratched our heads for a very long time uh, to try to understand what we were looking at. We wondered, are these individual nucleosomes? Are they groups of nucleosomes? And again, addressing that question turns out not to be super straightforward, um, especially because these are um, you know, at the limit of our resolution. Um, so in, in super resolution microscopy, again, we're localizing molecules. Um, and so um, every time we localize a molecule, in principle, um, uh, we are seeing a specific protein and we can count the number of times we localize something and that should correspond to the number of proteins. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of complications to that. Um, first of all, our labeling stoichiometry is not one-to-one. -one, so each protein may contain more than one fluorophore. And these fluorophores also blink. So each fluorophore may appear multiple times in our image. And we may not know if it's the same fluorophore or another fluorophore that is very close because we have a certain error in our ability to localize the fluorophores. And so again, just to make a long story short, um, in my lab, in order to um, overcome this problem and try to be more quantitative, we develop uh, what we call uh, calibration nano templates that allow us to calibrate our data and be able to count um, proteins inside cells at high resolution. And here's an example of uh, what we have done in the past. Uh, this is DNA origami uh, scaffold, which is uh, linear in uh, shape, and it has these handles sticking out. And these handles can be functionalized with a protein of interest. And so here I'm showing you GFP green fluorescent protein as an example um, of a proof of concept experiment. We can attach a single GFP to this origami, or we can attach two GFPs or three GFPs depending on how many handles we decide to functionalize. And so now we can actually control the number of proteins that we have, and we can uh, image these proteins. We can label them and image them just like we do um, in the cell. And here is an example of a super resolution image where one spot corresponds to a single GFP, two spots correspond to two GFPs nearby, and three correspond to three GFPs. So by doing this, we can assign the signal that we see to the number of proteins, and we can use that to calibrate our data. Um, and when we do something like that for uh, nucleosome images, 
um, we uh, realize that uh, these uh, nucleosome nanodomains are not individual nucleosomes, they're groups of nucleosomes. These groups are quite heterogeneous in size. They can contain only a few nucleosomes or a few hundred nucleosomes. Again, in terms of genomic length scale, that corresponds to somewhere between two to 10 kilobases. And we call these nucleosome groups, nucleosome clutches, like egg clutches, that can also form groups um, uh, of heterogeneous sizes. And these nucleosome clutches then um, come in close proximity, likely due to the folding of the DNA, to form larger domains, which uh, for now I'm calling clutch domains. And as you can see, this picture is quite different from the textbook model that um, I uh, showed you in the very beginning of my talk. In fact, now we think that uh, chromatin organization inside the nucleus is a lot more heterogeneous than what the textbook model suggests. We think chromatin is a disordered fiber um, and nucleosomes can form uh, these groups. And the number of nucleosomes within the groups, as well as their level of compaction, can be variable. And those groups further fold into domains. And again, the size of those domains is quite variable. And in this kind of a picture, um, we can imagine that gene activity can be controlled at multiple length scales. Um, so how large are the nucleosome clutches? How compacted are the nucleosomes within the clutches um, can help regulate gene activity? as well as how folded are the uh, clutches um, can help uh, regulate gene activity. Um, and so these are some of the things that uh, we're interested in looking at um, in the future. Now, despite this heterogeneity, um, chromatin structure at this nanoscale level um, seems to be cell type dependent um, and it can be manipulated with treatments. And so again, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. Here you're looking at a wild type uh, human fibroblast cell. Um, and again, I segmented uh, the chromatin uh, using that Voronoi segmentation approach. Um, and here is a human fibroblast cell, which we treated with an epigenetic drug called TSA. And um, the um, uh, end result of that treatment is that chromatin is forced into a more open state and becomes more transcriptionally active. And you can see that um, by doing this treatment, we have altered um, nanoscale chromatin organization dramatically. In fact, we no longer see this very dense compartment at the nuclear periphery. Um, the nucleosome clutches become smaller and more uniformly dispersed inside the nucleus, um, such that nucleosome clutch domains also become smaller. And so we can manipulate this organization and it reflects um, the um, condensation state of the chromatin as well as its level of activity. To go further, um, um, chromatin organization at this nanoscale level seems to correlate with the level of pluripotency of a cell. And so um, again, here is a plot that summarizes a lot of work that I'm going to try to explain uh, briefly. Um, so uh, we took human fibroblast cells and we reprogrammed them into a stem cell-like state. And we made multiple clones. Each clone comes from a single reprogrammed human fibroblast cell. And then um, you know, we quantified how pluripotent those clones are. How close are they to being a stem cell? And there are multiple ways of doing that characterization. Uh, what I'm showing you in this plot is a pluripotency score that we assigned based on gene expression profiles. Um, and so by comparing those gene expression profiles to stem cells, we can say that clone 13 resembles more a stem cell, has a higher pluripotency score compared to clone eight, which has a low pluripotency score. And on the y-axis here, I'm plotting clutch size. And you can see this nice inverse correlation between the level of pluripotency and clutch size. The higher the pluripotency, the smaller seem to be clutches. And the clutch domains also similarly correlate um, with the level of pluripotency. Um, now, um, as I said, um, not only um, is this uh, um, uh, chromatin nanoscale organization 
cell type dependent, but uh, it seems to adapt uh, to um, um, cells microenvironment and can be manipulated with drug treatment. So I want to show you one other example of that. Um, what we have done here is uh, we took human mesenchymal stem cells and we grew them on different substrates having different levels of stiffness. So we grew them either on glass or a stiff substrate, uh, 30 kilopascals um, composed of these um, uh, hydrogels uh, or a soft substrate, uh, three kilopascals in stiffness. Um, and the reason we did that is because um, there is a physiological relevance to this. Different tissues in our bodies have different levels of stiffness. And cells have been shown to adapt to their environment. And um, uh, a cell uh, grown on a stiff substrate, um, something like a bone, will differentiate to become a bone cell, whereas a cell grown on a soft substrate will differentiate into a different cell type. So we wondered if the chromatin structure also depends on the substrate and the microenvironment, uh, the biophysical microenvironment on which the cell is grown. And here again, I'm showing you um, super resolution images. These are heat maps now, again, based on this Voronoi polygon density. So red corresponds to higher density, more compact chromatin, and blue corresponds to lower density, less compact euchromatin. And you can immediately see that chromatin looks very different on these different substrates. Um, in particular, on a soft substrate, um, chromatin seems to be highly sequestered at the cell periphery. And there is this increase at peripheral condensed chromatin. And we can quantify that. So first, uh, we can look at the condensation level of chromatin um, by looking at this Voronoi density. And we split chromatin into two compartments, the euchromatin compartment and the heterochromatin compartment. And the condensation state of both of those compartments seem to depend on substrate stiffness. So uh, chromatin undergoes decondensation on stiff substrates and then a recondensation again on soft substrates in addition to this spatial reorganization from uh, being distributed more uniformly throughout the nucleus to being more peripheral. We also looked at histone marks, epigenetic marks, that are markers of active or silenced chromatin. And again, to make a short story long, we find that under soft substrates, H3K4ME3, which is a marker of active chromatin, the levels go down. Um, and um, on um, uh, an H3K27ME3, which is a marker of silenced chromatin, the levels of that go up, especially at the uh, border on a soft substrate. Um, so we see these uh, changes in chromatin condensation and spatial organization that again correlate with the presence of these activating and silencing marks. Now, again, why is this important? As I mentioned to you, oh, and before I go into that, I wanted to also talk a little bit about, you know, the underlying mechanisms. So um, uh, as I showed you here, we, um, so that the silencing mark, H3K27ME3, goes up um, under soft substrates um, and is more enriched at the nuclear periphery. Um, now, uh, we wondered if the enzyme that actually deposits that silencing mark um, uh, may be involved in this substrate stiffness dependent chromatin remodeling and reorganization. So to understand that, we blocked that enzyme with a treatment again, uh, GSK treatment uh, blocked EZH2, which is the enzyme that deposits that silencing epigenetic mark. And here, um, you're again looking at cells grown on glass substrate, stiff substrate, or soft substrate. And under control conditions, once again, you see that substrate dependent remodeling of chromatin nanostructure but if we block EZH2, uh, we no longer get that uh, reorganization uh, under soft substrate. So we think that um, EZH2 and the position of that silencing mark is important for that reorganization. And again, as I mentioned, this is physiologically relevant, but it's also pathologically relevant because 
um, in disease, um, the biophysical microenvironment uh, of the cell can change um, and stiffness of the tissue can change. Um, so to look at that, um, again, we took cells uh, from a young patient um, uh, that uh, went to the hospital for um, reason other than, um, you know, tendonitis, which is what we are comparing to. Um, we also took cells from a patient that had tendonitis. Um, um, this is a joint uh, disease um, where, um, um, you know, um, uh, the, the use of the joint becomes um, um, uh, um, less uh, possible. And then we also took uh, cells from an aged uh, patient and we compared their chromatin organization. And you can see again here, um, cells taken from a tendonitis patient resemble cells grown on a soft substrate. Um, whereas cells taken from an aged uh, patient resemble um, uh, cells grown on a stiff substrate. And again, here is the quantification. Um, you can see that um, when we look at cells uh, from the tendonitis patient, um, the condensation level of chromatin is higher compared to control cells. Um, so chromatin undergoes condensation, whereas under aging, it undergoes decondensation. So we wonder, can we actually take young human cells um, and um, perturb their chromatin organization and make it look more like a disease state? And indeed, if we take young um, tenocytes um, and we grow them on glass versus stiff versus soft substrate, we can make them um, uh, uh, reorganize their chromatin to resemble and age uh, chromatin uh, nanoorganization or a diseased uh, chromatin nanoorganization. And so um, um, the nanoorganization, the condensation level, the spatial um, um, organization of the chromatin um, seems to be uh, highly dependent on cell type, on the biophysical cues, as well as chemical cues um, that the cells are subjected to. And all these cues likely in the body uh, work together to regulate um, the nanoscale organization of chromatin and um, um, uh, as well as the phenotype of the cell. So all this made us wonder, can we actually um, assign a cell type or a disease state just simply based on um, chromatin nanoorganization? And to do that, we went to machine learning. So we developed a machine learning approach that allows us to classify super resolution images. Um, so what we do is we have input data that we um, uh, segment using this Voronoi tessellation. Um, we then um, blur the data because we want to get multi-scale information from this data. So we convolve it with a Gaussian um, to blur it uh, at multiple length scales. And then we apply a filter, a Laplacian filter, to extract features from uh, these uh, uh, differently blurred images. And then um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is multi-scale feature detection. So these little circles as well as larger circles tell us about the features within the image at these different length scales. And then um, we um, have what we call a bag of visual words um, that correspond to these different features. Um, and so what we, next, uh, what we do next is to use training data. So here is, for example, human fibroblasts or human fibroblasts treated with an epigenetic drug. Um, and we use this as training data. The computer extracts the features, compares to the bag of visual words, and makes a histogram of the visual words that appear in these images. And the histogram that comes from the human fibroblast is going to look different from that that comes from the uh, treated uh, human fibroblast. And then we give computer data that it has not seen before, that it has not been trained on, and ask it to classify it. And as you can see, it does quite well in classifying um, a human fibroblast uh, versus a treated human fibroblast. Um, there is this uh, small amount of misclassification, which I think actually is not misclassification, but human fibroblasts 
have heterogeneity in their chromatin nanoscale organization. And some of them actually resemble a treated cell. And I think the computer is capturing that. And so we are able to use this machine learning approach and we have applied it also to uh, classify cells uh, that are differentiated versus pluripotent um, or that have different levels of pluripotency uh, and we are able to discriminate them. Um, so we're quite excited by this. We think that this can be an approach to um, look at um, subtle perturbations in chromatin nanoorganization as cells undergo a disease process or in looking at um, um, cell fate transitions. Now, um, I'm going to wrap up uh, at this point. Um, I think I'm already over time. Um, so I hope if you got anything from uh, my talk, uh, I uh, showed you that using uh, new methods, uh, we are now starting to get a new understanding of how chromatin is organized inside the nucleus and how that organization can impact cell uh, state. I want to thank the people who have done the work. Um, this has been um, a wonderful collaboration with several people. Um, so I'm very lucky to have uh, wonderful collaborators. Um, the chromatin work started as a collaboration and continues uh, to this day as a collaboration with Pia Cosma's lab at CRG in Spain. Um, and uh, Maria Aurelia, who has uh, moved on uh, since being a student and postdoc in the two labs, um, did the initial work that I showed you on chromatin organization. Um, I have been collaborating with Rob Mauk and Suchin Peo at UPenn um, to look at how substrate stiffness and biophysical cues impact chromatin nanoscale organization. So what I showed you in terms of substrate stiffness has been a result of a wonderful collaboration with um, these uh, two researchers at UPenn. And the uh, machine learning work uh, was in close collaboration with the group of uh, Jerome Solon um, in Basque uh, country in Spain. Um, and several trainees uh, have been involved over the years. Um, I mentioned Maria Aurelia, uh, Jason has helped uh, looking at uh, chromatin and DNA organization. Um, and several other, other uh, talented students and postdocs. And I'm grateful for our funding and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lakaram Yala. That was fantastic. I, I, I really liked it. Um, and uh, you weren't over time. I would say you were exactly on time, which is perfect. Uh, and if you wanna take a glass of water, just take a drink. Uh, we'll move to the question and answer session pretty quickly. Uh, just a reminder to everyone in the session, if you would like to uh, ask a question in the session, please use the raise hand icon uh, to bring your name up to the top. I see there might be some questions already in the Zoom chat, but if you would like to ask in person, you are welcome to do so. Otherwise, I will tackle the Zoom questions in the chat anonymously. Uh, if anyone on YouTube would like to ask questions, please enter them in the chat now. Uh, we are very happy to, to address questions. We've already got a couple popping to the top in the Zoom session. So uh, I will allow, I just have to take a moment to allow people to unmute themselves. Okay, and then the first question comes from Rebea Sebold. Could you please uh, unmute yourself, turn on your video, briefly introduce yourself and ask your question? Um, I'm hi, I'm... Sorry. I'm Rabia Seibold. I'm uh, working as a postdoc at McGill in the group of Paul Francois. Um, I really like your talk. Um, it's really, really nice to see all this fine scale, uh, fine scale structure um, in the chromo, uh, uh, in the nucleosome, uh, nucleus. Sorry, um, I was wondering just a little bit about your Voronoi tessellation. Um, uh, first, um, when you went to the density plots, I wasn't sure why you used still the Voronoi tessellation and not just the density of points. But um, most of all, I was wondering with your color coding of different regions, um, like different connected regions, wouldn't that really depend on your dimensionality? I mean, in reality, the nucleus is 3D, so the connectivity might be a lot larger than you would see in your 2D um, uh, image. Yeah. W wonderful question. So the first question about the density, to get a density, you have to make a grid of some sort, right? So you have to choose a grid size. And we think that the Voronoi is kind of a nice way without 
having to impose a grid size um, to tell you about density. Um, and so we can also make a box, right, and run that box across the nucleus and get density representation that way. And they do tend to agree with each other. So it's another way to do that. Um, and yeah, absolutely. We have also done 3D imaging. Um, um, and, uh, you know, uh, mostly we're looking at 2D projections um, and there's definitely three dimensionality to this. Um, um, uh, so this is something that we should probably be looking more at. Um, but, um, you know, from what we have done so far, it hasn't impacted too much our conclusions in terms of, you know, these domains and their size. Um, but of course they're not, um, you know, 2D. Um, what we, we are doing is looking at a thin section um, and we have made our sections thinner and thinner. Um, so we have looked at like a hundred nanometer section um, and, and uh, in order to sort of like limit that three dimensionality to some extent and our conclusions seem to hold. Um, but absolutely in the future, I think um, doing this imaging fully in 3D uh, to get the full picture would be the absolutely right way to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Rabea, please lower your hand if you're done asking the question. Uh, the next question will come from uh, Venkata Somasi. Please uh, uh, unmute yourself, turn on your video if you like, uh, ask your question. Introduce yourself briefly if you can. Uh, thank you, Professor Lagdumi. It's a very good talk. Uh, I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering. I'm a first year PhD student, so I have a lot of questions. So my point is, uh, uh, Actually, you use some on and off fluorescence technique to actually figure out a few aspects, right? I mean, uh, the thing what I wanted to work on is that it's actually to see vasculature in uh, cellular uh, things, uh, cellular microarchitecture. So can we use similar technique to measure the roughness of whatever vasculature we use? Because uh, measuring roughness is very difficult for us to actually do that. That's one thing. And second question is uh, you have a, I mean, you use the hydrogel stiffness uh, to measure the chromatin. May I know what is the name of the hydrogel because it's still unpublished work. Thank you. Oh yeah, no, that is published. Um, um, and, um, you know, it's uh, um, from the labs of Rob Mauck as well as Jason Burdick at UPenn. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to tell you off the top of my head the exact name of the hydrogel, but it's absolutely published um, and, and you can look it up. Um, uh, the first question was about looking at vasculature and are you doing this in vivo? Yeah. Um, inside an organism? Uh, yeah, actually, it's in vitro and uh, I'll also do in vivo later. But uh, okay. yeah, the roughness is the main issue actually. Uh, how to image the roughness, that's the whole problem. Yeah, so I mean, you know, again, these methods are, are limited to things that you can label with fluorescent markers. Um, they're um, mostly suitable for fixed cell imaging at the point. Um, so your sample needs to be fixed and relatively flat. Um, so looking at roughness, I'm imagining that's more like a 3D um, problem. And, um, you know, um, our spatial resolution, the 2D is in the order of uh, 30 nanometers. In the three, third dimension, it's much lower because there's always this trade off between, you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, in the Z dimension, the spatial resolution is more in the order of 50 to 60 nanometers. So it depends again on like the roughness that you expect and how it compares to the spatial resolution of the method. Um, so that's another issue. Um, so I'm not super sure without knowing more about the <laughs> biological system, whether it's suitable or not. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Venkata. Please lower your hand if you're done. Uh, now we have uh, an anonymous question from the Zoom chat. Uh, the anonymous question is actually two questions. Uh, it's, uh, thanks for the fantastic talk. That wasn't the question, but... Uh, <laughs> starts that way. Two questions. One, uh, do we know how chromatin organization is mechanically linked with uh, substrate stiffness directly through cytoskeleton and nuclear envelope deformation? Two, uh, how does glass differ from stiff substrate adhesion? Yeah, fantastic question. So um, 
Yes. Um, so the first question is about connectivity between the cytoskeleton and the nucleus. And there's a lot of work done on that topic. And I haven't shown you this data, but we have also seen that, um, you know, cell contractility is known to change under these different hydrogels. And, um, you know, if we block the contractility machinery, we also block these uh, chromatin uh, remodeling events. And so we do think that there is a big link between um, the cytoskeletal um, machinery, the cell contractility, um, the mechanical stiffness and the chromatin reorganization that we see. We're still working on dissecting more clearly the, the exact underlying mechanisms involved. Um, and then the other question was, I can repeat um, question two, no problem. Yeah. Uh, the question two is how is glass different from- Right, uh, so, so, so glass is very stiff, it's gigapascals, right? Um, so it's mostly, um, you know, we expect it to be a very highly stiff substrate um, uh, compared to both the stiff and the soft um, hydrogels. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I think I see no other hands raised. Oh, there's one. Rabia has a follow-up question. Please uh, unmute yourself, Rabia, if you'd like to ask a follow-up question. I Go actually ahead. don't have a follow-up question. I just have a different question. <laughs> um, I, um, I was wondering, there's a lot of discussion that I've heard about these kind of organizations within the nucleus being driven by uh, phase separation. Yes. You didn't comment on, on the origin of what you see. Um, so what is your interpretation? Yeah, again, great question. And the short answer is, I don't know at this point. Um, so I don't know what regulates the formation of these clutches. We know that they can be manipulated. Um, so by changing the acetylation level of histones, by changing you know, um, their post-translational modifications um, and all of these things could impact um, a, the process of a phase separation, right? So um, acetylated histones have been shown to undergo different type of phase separation compared to non-acetylated histones. So it could play a role. Um, there is at, at this point, not a very good way that I can think of to test, you know, directly phase transition and its role um, on, on what we see. But it's something that, yeah, we are interested in. And if you have any ideas, I'm happy to hear about it. Um, I remember from like physics um, stuff in soft matter that when you want to look into phase separation, you always um, you tend to look at the static structure factor instead of the um, like Voronoi tessellation that you did. Mm -hmm. um, did you compare like the kind of results you would expect versus what you get? No, we have not. I mean, yeah, that would be something interesting to do. Um, also with uh, phase separation, I feel like some of the, the strict tests that you apply to test if something is phase separated um, are done more in living cells. So we have to also come up with a way of being able to visualize and measure these structures in a living cell, which is kind of challenging right now. But yeah, definitely uh, an exciting topic and an interesting thing to look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I think there are a couple more questions potentially. I know that uh, Paul Wiseman wanted to ask one, but he hasn't raised his hand yet. And I see another raised hand there uh, from Rodrigo Reyes. Uh, so I think you get your the last question, Rodrigo. Could you please uh, unmute yourself, turn on your video if you like, uh, introduce yourself briefly. And Hello, Melike. Uh, Hi. Really nice talk. I'm. Uh, I'm an associate professor at biology. I work also, I do single molecule, mainly in uh, bacteria and uh, more recently in yeast. Um, uh, and we also work with uh, chromatin, but, um, but um, I was, I mean, it's, it's really beautiful these, uh, these images that you, you were showing. And, and I also had this idea about chromatin a little bit, uh, uh, you know, like the classical, uh, organization that you were talking at, uh, at the uh, at the beginning of your talk. Um, now, my question is, uh, I mean, you talked about the, the, the density of the clusters of uh, nucleosomes, but what about the spacing? At some points you have like a, like these lano clusters that you call um, mm -hmm. that are like, uh, and, and you have spaces without any mm -hmm. label. I yeah. Mean, can, 
I mean, what, what kind of like so thing can you So we think those are more sort of open uh, chromatin spaces. Um, so it could be completely deployed of nucleosomes, or it could be that there is so few that we're not able to detect them. Um, but we think that there are more sort of um, open regions interdispersed with these more densely compacted regions of nucleosomes. <clears throat> but I mean, is that is that what you would be expecting? Uh, like, um, I mean, or, we, or... we often find, you know, I mean, based on the text model, that's not what we would be expecting, right? Text model is very ordered, hierarchical, but I think that, you know, uh, this is um, becoming um, more um, clear nowadays, additionally, with uh, using electron tomography, um, um, the lab of um, 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 uh, Erin O'Shea at uh, Salk Institute showed um, that chromatin is not, um, you know, hierarchical and ordered. Um, using electron tomography, she developed a way to be able to detect DNA specifically in electron microscopy using a dye that actually gives contrast in electron microscopy, and she was able to um, visualize more specifically DNA uh, organization and did not find uh, organization compatible with a 30 nanometer fiber. And her conclusions are also that chromatin is more disordered and their uh, density and the spacing of the nucleosomes is, is what controls um, um, you know, accessibility. Uh, and that can be quite uh, heterogeneous. So what we have shown with super resolution microscopy and what she has shown with electron tomography are very much in line with each other. So I think you know, we're starting to sort of think of an alternative model uh, for, for how chromatin is organized. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the question. And uh, please let's thank, please everyone, let's thank uh, Professor Lakadamiale one more time. Uh, to thank her, please write something in the chat uh, in the Zoom session or in YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. I will share the, the chat transcript with Professor Lakadamiale after the colloquium. Uh, so please just let her know that you appreciated her talk. Uh, it's a substitute for applause. Just write whatever you like. Um, and uh, uh, with that, I think I will end uh, our colloquium session by uh, reminding everyone that we'll be back next week on Friday at 3.30 p.m. for a very interesting colloquium on uh, science applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it will be a talk from Shiraji Sondi from uh, Princeton. And he's going to talk about digital herd immunity. So I wish.